Friends, let's uh, again bear before our God and ask for his help as we come to his word. <coughs> our God, your word declares that the entrance of your is light. We ask, Almighty God, that as your word is preached today, that you would cause that light to shine, to shine within our minds, to shine within our hearts. That the very truths about yourself that, that we will read about again in your word this morning might come as it were with new light that we might have a glimpse of you this morning that perhaps we have forgotten. A glimpse of you, Lord, that perhaps even we have not seen before. That your word would lead us to you. And that it would reveal to us something of the glory and majesty of your holy character. We pray for your help. We thank you for your goodness to us in giving us your spirit to, to provide for us understanding into spiritual things. And we ask that he would do that for us this morning, that you would be glorified. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. Friends, all of us here, I guess to some degree or another, enjoy listening to music. And although we may not necessarily share a common opinion about what kind of music is good music, what kind of music is, is beautiful music, I think that there would be certain songs which almost all of us would have the same opinion about. Not because we all enjoy them, but because together we've all actually grown to loathe them. There are songs, aren't there, which have been so played to death, whether it be on the radio or on the TV or at public events or wherever, songs that, that we have heard over and over and over again. Songs that we couldn't have even escaped from hearing, even if we had tried. That as soon as we even begin to hear the first bars of those songs, we begin to cringe. Oh no, not that song again. Remember, if you can, back to the late 80s when the World Expo was held in Brisbane. Do you remember the song that was played over and over again here in Queensland that year? It seemed to be. Think German Pavilion. Think, that's right, the infamous chicken dance. Whenever I begin to hear that tune played, I cringe and I think, oh no, not that song again. Or well, what about in the early 90s where when a certain song by Billy Ray Cyrus seemed to be on almost every radio station. It was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Even the ABC seemed to be playing it. You know the song, Achy Breaky Heart. Now, friends, be honest. When you hear that song, don't you begin to think, yourself, think to yourself and, and cringe within yourself, oh, no, not that song again. Or what about the man? That song that became so popular in the, in the late 1990s, I think those images of the former treasurer Peter Costello doing that dance on the Kerry Ann Kennelly show are so burned within our memories that it only increases that song's cringeworthiness. That whenever we hear it, we say again, oh no, not that song again. Now, I don't know what the modern-day equivalents are. 
And perhaps those of you who are under 25 can add a few more recent songs to the list, but at any rate, there are songs, aren't they, that have become, that at the time became so, so popular that they were repeated over and over again until eventually we got sick of listening to them. We groaned whenever our ears had the misfortune of hearing those tunes again. And if it's possible, we do whatever we can to switch that radio or TV or whatever it is off so that our ears aren't assaulted. In a similar way, and yet we would say in a sad way, there are also a For us who are Christians, there are also a handful of Bible passages that seem to elicit a similar response in us. There are passages which we might say seem to be in the all-time top ten of of favourite passages that preachers preach from. We've heard sermons preached from, from those passages many, many times before that when the text is announced now, we say to ourselves, Oh no. Not that text again. Isn't that true? (laughs) Is there not in some sense that have felt that way before? Friends, as we continue this morning this series on the character and nature of our God, we're going to be turning to just such a passage. Because it's the classic passage on the attribute of God that we will be looking at. Indeed, I'm I'm sure that you are so familiar with this passage that all I have to do is announce its location and you will immediately know what attribute of God we will be looking at today. Before I tell you what it is, can I encourage you to resist temptation to groan and switch off this morning. Resist that devilish suggestion that there is little left for you to learn from this passage. For though we may be very familiar with its words, there are truths here that we need to find it about frequently. Not only because we have a natural tendency to forget spiritual things, but also because we we have a sinful tendency to often, often doubt whether God is really like this at all. What attribute of God about? Well, turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. So you already know, don't you, what what attribute of God we are speaking on this morning. And we're going to be reading the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 6. In the year, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and that was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, This has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. As we look at 
this attribute of God this morning. We're going to do it under three main headings. Firstly, I want us to see the of God's holiness, the gravity of his holiness. Secondly, the purity of his holiness. And thirdly, the necessity of God's holiness. Firstly, the gravity of his holiness. This passage in Isaiah 6, as I have mentioned, is, is this well-known passage that, that speaks of the holiness of God. Here the prophet Isaiah is in the temple. He has a vision of the Lord seated upon his throne. And while Isaiah sees those angelic beings called seraphim flying about in the very presence of God, and as they fly, he hears the sound of them crying to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Is filled with his glory. The scene is reminiscent of, of, of something that we read about also in the, in the book of Revelation in, in chapter 4. There the apostle, apostle John witnesses a similar scene as four living creatures around the throne of God cry out to one another with an almost identical refrain. Holy, holy, Holy Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Of course, these aren't the only passages which which talk about the holiness of God. And we'll be looking at at some of those other passages later on this morning, but we, we might well say that in fact the scriptures, in the scriptures, God emphasizes his holiness more than any attribute of his character. Nowhere else in the Bible do we see God speaking about his perfections in this threefold way as he does in Revelation 4 and here in Isaiah 6. Though in this series we have looked at an, of the attributes of God already, nowhere yet have we seen God declaring that he is wise, wise, wise. Nowhere have we seen him declare that he is omnipotent, 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 or immutable, immutable, immutable. We will not see anywhere in the scriptures him himself as love, 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 or mercy, 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 but we do see him on more than one occasion declaring himself to be holy, holy, holy. It's an attribute of his nature which itself seems to place special emphasis upon. And that is in part why why I've entitled this first section The Gravity of God's Holiness. It's of crucial importance if we are to rightly understand who God is that we understand that he is a holy God. It requires our our, our serious attention, our our serious thought. Because it is that that attribute of God which he himself gives special attention to. But what does that word mean? What does the word holy actually mean? Usually when we think about the holiness of God, our, our first thought is probably concerning God's purity. His sinless, sinlessness, his moral integrity, the, the, the perfect and nature of his character. And while that is true, and we will look at that shortly, it, it is not the chief sense of the word holy. For the word holy at the very root of its meaning refers to that which is separate. To that which is set apart, distinct from everything else around it. The word holy is used this way in the Bible perhaps more than we realise. Think, for example, about the various utensils and furniture that were, that were used in the tabernacle or in the temple. They were often described, weren't they, as holy. 
In Exodus 40, verses 9 and 10, Moses was told to anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. You shall hallow it and all its utensils and it shall be holy. All these things were holy because they were sinless. They were inanimate objects. Not, not holy because they were morally pure. How could they be? But they were holy because they had been separated from all other utensils. And they'd been set apart and dedicated to the service of God. They were holy. Likewise, in Leviticus 20, the nation of Israel is described as a holy people. A holy nation. God says to them in verse 26, And you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Israel were holy not because they were sinless, not because they were perfectly pure, but because they, because God himself had separated them. He had set them apart for himself. And this then is the, the chief meaning of this word holy. It refers to that which is is separate, which is other, which is distinct from everything else around it. And friends, this is the very nature of God himself and we have touched on this sermon in this series. God is distinct. He is set apart from all his creatures. We creatures are, are finite and limited, but God himself is infinite. We creatures are by the constraints of time and space. But God is eternal and omnipresent. We creatures are utterly dependent, utterly dependent on him for everything. He is wholly independent. He needs nothing or no one. Indeed, he says, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is none like me. To whom will you liken me? It cannot be done. I am set apart from all other. I am holy. And this, this holy nature of God reminds us of the vast distance. The vast distance there is between God and his creatures. And this is why scriptures often speak of God as being high and exalted. They speak of him being lofty and lifted up. In Isaiah 57, 15, for example, God himself declares, for thus says the high one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. In fact, this is the very first thing that Isaiah describes about. He sees this vision of him here in Isaiah 6, isn't it? Look at, look at the passage again. Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. God's holiness means that that there is a tremendous distance, as it were, between creator and creature. He is remote. He is, we might even say, aloof. He is far off. Indeed, the very holiness of God means that for the creature, God is inaccessible. He is unapproachable. You might say, well, 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 just hang on a second, preacher. You just overstepped the mark. Don't you that you've gone too far in talking about God's holiness? How can you say that God is unapproachable? Just let me say, if you were thinking like this, that I, that I understand the terms on which the Bible speaks of us, about, uh, speaks of how we make to God that we can do it only through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I have more to say about that later. But let us never forget. Let us never forget the bare, naked reality of which to speak. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God dwells in unapproachable light. And no man has seen or can see. Indeed, the mere, in his creatureliness, cannot approach God. He dare not approach God. For God is holy. He is so holy, he is so set apart, he is so majestic in his being that to draw near to the unveiled glory of God in our creatureliness would result in instant death for that creature. You remember the account of us on Mount Sinai? Exodus 33, Moses, after much communion with the Lord, pleaded with the Lord to show him his glory. But the Lord said to him that that wouldn't be possible. Exodus 33, verse 20, The Lord said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And so do you remember what happened? Instead of appearing to Moses in all of his resplendent glory, the Lord graciously hid him in the cleft of a rock. Passed by before him, God, as it were, placed his hand over Moses and shielded him from his own presence. So that when God finally passed by, all that Moses saw of God was his back part. And even then, when he came down from the mountain, he saw that even just that little glimpse of the glory of God. God knew that that was all that Moses could bear to see. God knew that Moses could not possibly survive if he appeared to him in all his glory. Such is the infinite distance and difference there is between the creature and the holy God. Friends, we we need also to say that such distance is not simply due to the presence of sin. Look back at our passage this morning. Look at verse 2. Here Isaiah sees the seraphim, those angelic beings who are utterly pure and holy. They have never sinned. They have always obeyed God with a perfect obedience. They are as pure in their nature as they were on the very day that God created them. What do we read about them in Isaiah 6 2? So they dwell in the presence of God. Yet these holy beings do not dare and presumably have never ventured to even look upon God in all his glory. There is something about God's nature that causes even the holy seraphim to distance, as it were, from such a God. Verse 2 says, Each have six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. Why do they hide their faces? Why do they shield their faces, shield their eyes? Why do they hide their feet, as it were? Not because they are sinful, but because they understand that they themselves are mere finite creatures. And they are present in the very presence of a holy God. Here we see before our eyes, as it were, that there is a vast, vast difference between God and everything that he has made. He is other. He is set apart, transcendent. He is holy. And 
is what can we say by way of application? We can say many things. But whatever might be said, it all ultimately comes back to this. That God must be worshipped. God must be worshipped. Because of who he is, God deserves to receive our highest acclaim. As the holy God, the God who is transmajestic and, and incomprehensibly glorious, he is worthy. Indeed, he is far above and beyond worthy of our soul's deepest veneration and praise. We must worship him. We must worship him alone. The, the brethren, even more than that, we must have a right conception, a right remembrance of who God is as we worship him. When we as the Lord's people gather together, for example, in this context of public worship, or, or even when we gather together in the context of public prayer, we must remember that we are worshipping, that we are addressing a holy God. And that holy God, that holy God, is actually present with us. We mustn't worship him carelessly or flippantly. We mustn't be, be light or, or trivial or, or blah about our worship of him. We mustn't regard him as some common, run-of-the-mill, everyday deity who couldn't care less how he is worshipped. Now, as Psalm 2.11 says, we must worship or serve him. No doubt you remember the account of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10. And turn with me there now, Leviticus 10. The priestly sons of Aaron entered into the very presence of God. And there they, they offered strange fire which the Lord himself had not commanded. And fire came out from the very presence of God and devoured them both. They did what the Lord himself said to Moses after that. Leviticus 10, verse 1. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Brethren, for most of us, the regular gathering for worship each Lord's Day is part of our weekly routine and right. But may God keep us. May God keep us from treating it as a mundane, as a common, trivial, or even worldly occasion. It is not that. It is not that at all. May God help us to regard him rightly, to pause, to take stock, to consider this reality each Sunday, I am coming to the Holy God. I am coming to worship a God who is worthy of my heartiest praise. I am coming to address in prayer a God whose name must be hallowed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed. I am coming. Hear the God 
the demands that he must be heard, that he must be obeyed. I'm coming into the very presence of God, the God who is infinitely holy and who demands that he be regarded as such when he is worshipped. Do we come with a sense of the gravity of God's holiness? This incident with no doubt and the boy who brings us secondly to another aspect of God's holiness. And it is, it is this aspect of God which, as I said before, is, is the one that we most often think about when we think of him as a holy God. In the scriptures, not only does the word holy mean set apart or separated, but in a narrower sense, he, the word holy means that God is pure, that he is clean, that he is spotless and perfect in righteousness. In short, to say that God is holy means that he is separated from all sin. So having looked at the gravity of God's holiness, let's come in the second place to look at the purest holiness. In Habakkuk 1.13, for example, we read, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. That is, he cannot look upon wickedness with a... Similarly, Psalm 5 verses 4 through to 6 says that you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all the workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who sin. God is perfectly righteous. His nature is utterly free from sin. He is holy in purity. And because his nature is holy, God cannot tolerate sin. He cannot, he cannot ignore even what to us appears even the smallest or slightest of sins. No sin is trivial for God. No sin is regarded by him as a thing. But he regards all of it with a holy hatred, with a holy displeasure, with a holy anger. And he must judge it with a holy justice, a justice that must result in the death of sinners. Remember Nadab and Abihu? The one time they worshipped God in the way that he had not appointed ended in God consuming them with fire. Remember Adam and Eve in Genesis 3? Their one single act of disobedience resulted in their death and expulsion from the garden of Eden. about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. A single lie about how much they had received for the price of a field was sufficient for God to strike at the feet of the apostles. What about Uzzah? 2 Samuel chapter 6, turn with me to this passage. Maybe you're not familiar with this passage. 2 Samuel chapter 6. It describes the account for us of the return of the ark of God from the Philistines. King David had had ordered the ark to be put on a cart and, and, and carried by oxen back to 
and thousands of Israelites were walking along beside it, worshipping and praising God as it went along. The ark was back among the people of God. And suddenly, amidst all of that commotion, it appeared as though the ark was full from its car. What happened? Look at verse 6. When they came to Macon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it and stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him there for his error and he died there by the ark of God. Now, others seem to have <laughs> the very best of intentions in doing what he did. He didn't want God to be dishonoured. He thought by letting the ark fall off the cart and into the dirt. But God had stipulated He had stipulated in his law that no one, no one was to touch that ark. No one was to touch the ark of his presence. Uzzah disobeyed. And was instantly struck down dead by God for his sin. Even though he acted with noble motives, But what is the reaction of your heart when you hear this account? What is the reaction in your heart when we hear, when you hear of those other accounts that I mentioned earlier? By our own standards, God's actions seem cruel. They seem far too harsh and drastic. His justice appears, at least to our minds, to be excessive, to be way over the top in terms of its, of its fairness and, and, and of its appropriateness. But friends, why do we think like that? In all honesty, friends, we think like that because we do not take sin, even our own sin, all that seriously. We do not really believe that our sin does kind of judge us. We do not really believe that our sin deserves that kind of justice that was meted out to Nadab and Abihu, to Ananias and Sapphira, and to others. Yes, we know that God is merciful, and He is. Yes, we know that he is long-suffering and patient and that he is forgiving. He is all those things, yes. But all of this does not mean for a single moment that God can or overlooks or ignores even the least of our sin. And the reality is, brethren, that in the justice of God we deserve to be treated in the same way as each of those other men were. Every time we worship God inappropriately or carelessly in ways that he has not ordained, we deserve the same fate as made out of the Bible. Every time we lie to God, we deserve the same fate as Ananias and Sapphira. Every time we disobey God, even though we may have the best of intentions, we have been struck down like others. And brethren, the very reason we do not believe that our sins deserve this same kind of judgment is because we do not really appreciate that our God is a holy God. We 
that our God, yes, even our God, is a consuming fire. As Hebrews 12, 29 says, and that it is a fearful thing. It is a fearful thing for a sinner to come into the presence of such a God. The prophet Isaiah understood that firsthand, didn't he? Look again at our passage this morning, Isaiah. What do we read in verse 5? Isaiah 6, verse 5. Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I'm undone, because I am a man of clean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah came into the presence of God and gained a glimpse of God's holiness, very suddenly became deeply conscious of his own sinfulness. Dread filled his heart as he realised that his his own sin and particularly his unclean lips brought him undone in the presence of God. I am ruined, he cries out. I am undone. I am a doomed man. As a sinful creature, I cannot bear to stand in the presence of such a holy God. Friends, notice also that in the midst of all this, Isaiah is actually proclaiming God's judgment upon himself. Woe is me. Woe is me. As a prophet of God, he would announce God's judgment upon many nations and woe to you, Jerusalem. Woe to you, Assyria. Woe to you who go down to Egypt. Woe to you who call evil good and good evil. You are doomed as part of Isaiah's message. For God's judgment is most certainly upon you. But here, here in the very presence of God, Isaiah is pronouncing God's curse upon himself. Woe is me. I myself am a doomed man. For I have seen the king. I have seen the Lord of hosts. And the curse of God is now justly upon me because of my sin. And this scene reminds us that there is a day coming when everyone who has ever lived, all of us, will appear before the judgment seat of God. 2 Corinthians 10 says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14 similarly says that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God and to each of us will give an account of himself to God. On that day, the Lord Jesus Christ will summon every individual to appear before him. Everything will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden. The secrets of sinful hearts will be laid bare before the sight of him whose eyes are like flaming fire and who can see into the deepest recesses of our heart. Those that appear before him 
upon that day as sinful creatures like Isaiah will suddenly become deeply conscious of their sin in a way that they have never had, never had before. And abject terror will fill their hearts and souls. They will realise that their sin has brought them undone in the presence of a holy God and they too will cry out, Woe is me! Woe is me! I am doomed! I am undone! As the Lord pronounces his judgement upon them and as they hear his voice like the voice of many waters saying, Depart from me, ye accursed ones, into the lake of fire that I have prepared the devil and his angels. Friends, that day is coming. That day is coming quickly. Are you to stand before such a God as this? Do not go to your judgment. Do not go to your judgment hoping that God will make some exception for you. Do not go to your judgment hoping that because of the life that you have lived or because of the things, what you think are good things that you have done, that on that basis, God will make an excuse. He will not. He is holy in his purity. He is holy in his justice. His justice is impartial. And you will not survive that day if you appear before him in your sinfulness. My folks, if anyone is ever to endure the final judgment of God, and it comes not by hoping that we ourselves will be clean enough for God, not by hoping that we ourselves will be clean enough for God to accept us, but we actually need God himself as clean. This then is our third point this morning, the necessity of God's holiness. We've seen the gravity of it, the purity of it. Let's look at the necessity of it. We need God to fit us and purify us for his holy presence. We need God himself to do whatever needs to be done in order that we might be right and acceptable to him. We see a picture of that again in our passage this morning. Verses 6 and 7. Isaiah says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Isaiah needed Christ himself to take away his iniquities. Isaiah needed Christ himself to purge him of his sin. Indeed, there is no other way by which a person can be made right before a pure and holy God except through the Lord Jesus Christ and the work which he has accomplished on behalf of of sinful men. Friends, if you do not yet know him as this, if you do not yet know him as that holy Saviour and Lord, then see now your absolute need of him. See that your whole eternal blessedness depends upon him and flee to him. 
flee from the wrath of a pure and holy God that is bearing down upon you because of your sin and flee to Christ. Flee to Christ. Resting the hope of your eternal salvation entirely upon Him and His work on behalf of sin. And it is a wonderful, it is a wonderful, wonderful work that Christ has done for us. Is that not true, believers? For those of us who have been redeemed by the Lord, cast your mind again over all that he has accomplished for us in order to make us right before a holy God. And stand in awe again. Stand in awe and wonder and amazement at what the Son of God did to fit you to appear before God. He lived that perfect, spotless life of obedience to his Father, doing everything that God required you to do. He obeyed God without fail. And he did that, not just outwardly, of course, but he did that even in his very thoughts and intentions and motives of his heart. He was absolutely sinless. And yet he willingly went to the cross and there believed paid in full. Nothing outstanding. He paid in full the punishment that you deserve for your sin. There upon the tree that he bore in his body the wrath of God the full measure of the wrath of God that our sins deserved and he experienced he experienced in full the very woe Isaiah cries out The sin-bearing Lord Jesus Christ was cursed by God for our sin. He was undone. He endured the sheer, unmitigated agony of being separated and forsaken and cut off from the presence of the God that he adored. Did that for us. He did that for us. Indeed, for all who trust in Him, He unites them to Himself. He forgives them of every single sin. He gives to them the gift of His own righteousness. He gives to sinners, as it were, His own holy standing, which is absolutely necessary if we are to enjoy eternally the presence of a holy God. What tremendous love the Lord Jesus has for sin. What amazing grace. What amazing grace He bestows. He bestows it upon sinful men that they might be right before God. Brethren, may we never, may we never ever lose a sense of wonder at what Christ has done for us. The pure, majestic, gloriously exalted and holy God was utterly unapproachable. Now for those who believe the Lord Jesus Christ has opened up the way to that God and he enables us to stand before him in his presence on the day of judgment even on that great day. And friends, what's more that day will be the, the beginning of something joy for all eternity. 
it will be the beginning of something that no one yet has ever enjoyed. We will have a sight of the Lord that Moses on this earth never had. We will have a view of God that the seraphims will never ever see. And now that we look through a glass darkly, yet on that day we will see our God and Saviour face to face. Face to face. And when he appears, we shall be holy like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we will enjoy the blessedness of his presence. What a glorious future awaits God's people. To be able to live in the very presence of the Holy God for all eternity. What a gloriously unspeakable privilege that is. Why would our Lord do that for us? Why would he do that for us? There's many reasons. But one of the chief reasons is found in Psalm 130. Please turn with me there as we close. You, Lord, should mark iniquities. Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. Why? That you may be feared. That you may be feared. The Lord forgives us, friends and fits us to stand before a holy God, not that we might become blasé or careless about our conduct before him, not that we might take his grace for granted, not that we might regard our relationship with him as some trivial or insignificant thing, but he does it in order that we might fear him, that we might revere him, and regard him as holy all the more. We have been brought near to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to us, as we read, by those who come near you, I will be regarded as holy. And surely we who have been forgiven ought to be. We ought to be the very ones who ever live to honour and exalt and worship this gloriously holy God. May God by his spirit help us to do that. Oh my God, and can we say that? And thank you. And thank you, our God, for what you have done for us. What you have done for us in the person of your Son. And Lord, we ask again, even this morning, that that we might not lose that sense of wonder, that sense of amazement of what Jesus has done for us. Lord, what a blessed, blessed.
and truth it is. But now we can come into the presence of a holy God. Sins forgiven. Fully righteous. Fully clean. Lord, may the real that truth of those truths stir our hearts to do as your word says, to fear you more, to worship you more, to give to you in reverence and honour and acclaim that you deserve. Help us to that end, we pray, for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.